I'm excited today to share with you a lesson where we're going to paint flowers on a gessoed surface. In other words, any surface. It could be a board, a canvas, a paper, an old failed painting. Any surface will work, but what you have to do is properly prepare it. And we're going to do that with gesso. So we'll talk more about that later. This is an example of what I'm going to be painting today. So I'm, I've got a lot, of, couple of new products I'm going to be sharing with you too. So let's get started. So the first thing we're going to be working with is gesso. And gesso is a product that is available everywhere. They're all good. This happens to be Liquitex, but they're, they're all good. And it's what artists who work in oil and acrylic put on their canvas. But we're, in this case, going to put this on our paper. And it provides a beautiful surface for the watercolor. The, the surface is going to be similar to Yupo. However, Yupo never absorbs the color. It just dries laying on top of it because it's plastic. But on this surface, it actually absorbs into the gesso. Now, a new product that I'm going to be sharing with you today, there's a whole new line of watercolors put out by Golden. They're, they're very big and they're excellent quality and they're mostly in acrylic, but they have come out with their own line of watercolors and they're called Cor, Q-O-R. And the product I'm gonna talk about is called the Watercolor Medium. And just by putting a little bit of this on your painting, on your palette, let's say, and then adding a little water to it, what it does is it makes the surface shiny. I really like this little bit of shine when I'm done. It's not anything necessary, but it's just something I enjoy. In terms of brushes, we don't need a lot of brushes, but I am going to use two flats. This is a one inch flat. I'm gonna use that to put the gesso onto the paper. I'm going to use this half inch flat as a lifting brush later when I'm painting because all the bristles are cut the same length and this is a very stiff brush made by Kalish, one of my very favorite brushes, it's from Ireland. And this will lift because it's just so stiff. But on gesso, just about any brush will lift, but this works really well. And then just a round brush and a script brush for applying the paint. The last thing we're going to use is a painting knife and it's often referred to as a palette knife, but a painting knife is a more accurate description. And again, any size will work. I'm going to be using, it's just a, like a little one inch, and I'm just going to use this to smooth out the paint, the gesso, as we apply it. <laughs> so, and then last but not least, I have a new product made by Daniel Smith called Ultramarine Turquoise. And let me tell you, this is a beautiful color. First of all, I want my colors to be transparent and secondly, non-staining. This has both of those qualities and it has an additional quality that I particularly like, and that is that it granulates. It's made from an ultramarine base, so it will, it will give you a certain amount of granulation. So it looks like we're ready to get started and prepare our painting ground. First of all, I'm going to show you how I like to work with a square 15 inch format surface. So I just take a regular watercolor paper and first of all, cut it into a half sheet. I like to leave it with a deckle edge and then I'm going to take half of this and set it over the top. And then I'm just going to fold this over. And see, that gives me a 15 inch square. Absolutely love this for, for a painting size. 11 is sort of small. This is nice. So again, I cut that off. And the interesting thing is, I love this little tail. I never just, sorry, I never just give that a toss. This is all good paper. So I just usually step out the door 
and pick some leaves, lay them down, have some fun with color sanding, and they make wonderful little gifts. And then framed up, they're absolutely one of my most popular sand pieces. So now using this size, I'm going to show you how to prepare the ground. When you're preparing the ground for this painting, we're going to be creating all kinds of textures. I actually came around with my palette knife. You can see some lines just scribbled in here. That was all intentional. I just scribbled that in into the gesso before it, before it dried. And you can see this lovely square format now. So the next thing we're going to do is I'm going to show you. Here is a ground. This is just a piece of nice matte board. It makes a great ground for painting. You can see it was an, a failed painting. See, this is cool. You can take your old dogs and recycle them. And when I did the gesso under here, you can see how some of the color still comes through. The gesso is water-based. So when you put this over your failed painting, it actually reactivates some of the color and you get these beautiful toned paintings. You can see some of the fun lines. Here's another old dog that I put textures on. And you can see, again, some of the colors just coming through. Here's another one. So sometimes I even choose an old dog painting that might have the colors that are going to look good in the picture that I'm going to paint. So this one has a, a beautiful warm color coming through. And here's another little trick. If you take and turn these over, after you've painted them and it's dry, if you turn it over you, and put another coat of gesso on the back, you can actually just do another texture in it too in case you don't like the one on the other side. Then when they're both dry, you have a choice of two. But I find I always like to do a coat in the back too. And what that does, look at it, leaves it absolutely flat. They tend to curl a little bit. If you just put the paint on one side and then let it dry and you don't put a coat on the other side, they do curl up a bit. But you can see here, beautiful, just as dry, flat as can be. Now here's another, this is one of those little tails I cut off of a failed painting. Again, this is all ready for another picture. Now if you don't like that much color coming through, some people find it really hard to draw on it and they, it, they're just not comfortable, just give it another coat. Just simply get this out, give it another coat. Here's um, a failed painting that was on canvas. So you can see the painting ground doesn't make any difference. You choose whatever whatever you have around. I think you could do this on glass or any surface because gesso sticks to everything. So it's a great product. So on this fail painting, I did the sides too because I may never frame this. If I paint my picture and go right around the edge, it's ready to present with nothing more than a, some wire in the back. Okay, I'm going to work with a failed painting here, but just to show the contrast, this is a brand new piece of paper that I did. In fact, this picture that I'm going to paint today, I did this on a brand new paper. So you can see how nice and white all the edges are. And this is one waiting, waiting for the drawing. Today I thought I would just go ahead and do it on a failed painting. So this is the gesso and it's white. You, there's also a gold gesso, there's a clear gesso, there's black gesso. This product comes in a lot of different, um, what would you call it, mediums. The one I'm going to do is white. So I'm just simply going to put this down. I'm going to take my one inch flat brush and just simply paint away. You can see it's a very, very white product. It's really cool. Now I think this one has so much color sanding and everything, I may have to give it a little bit more. You'll also notice I put on a apron. The thing is, this paint, gesso, if you get it on your clothes, 
you're going to be wearing it forever. So I always recommend either putting on some kind of a cover-up. Oh yeah, I can see this one's going to need a little bit more. So the first thing is just to do a coat with the brush. Now one of the things I like to recommend is that you take off as much of this gesso as you can with a paper towel or some kind of tissue so that you're not running that gesso down the drain. Just take off. That's a hot tip. You want to keep that drain running. Now I'm ready to come in and add some additional gesso. I love this applicator. You can see how fun it is. In fact, one of the things you can do is to put the gesso into another container that would give you a nice line like this and just leave that line as part of your picture. In this case, I'm just going to come in and I'm going to take my palette knife and smooth this out. Now it's real easy to get these real, you know, to tip it and get these real dark lines. I'm going to try to avoid that. I'm just creating lovely textures that magically turn into this background on your painting. It's really cool. Okay, now we're ready to do some of the script. I really like this. Now, not everybody likes this, but I happen to be in love with it. So I purposely come in and do these fun, try to keep them really free. And I do these lines using the top of my palette knife. I found if I turn over my brush, for example, it's just too broad. The lines are too heavy, but I like this. It's just that very thin blade. And it's just enough to give me a little extra. Another thing I like to do is to take a fine mister. This is one that has the narrow inner so that you're going to be getting a nice fine mist. And by just spraying this around the edges, I find I get rid of some of those strokes that look like the paintbrush. And it also gives me kind of a vignette style of working. I like that where the edges just sort of melt. The painting just melts into the edges of your paper. It's called a vignette. So just by spraying a little bit, particularly along the edges, this will give you that nice effect. Now there are a lot of people who at this time would take and press in all kinds of objects. You could take some something from nature like leaves and you could use burlap textures, you could press stencils. There's just a lot of things you can do to make a nice surface. I, I usually, I'm happy with just this, but don't overlook the possibilities of coming up with some of your own ideas. Okay, we're ready to get started. So I took this same theme again, the cone flowers or echinacea. They're just a beautiful, beautiful flower. And I always like to show like a full cycle of life. I often even show one of these poor guys almost on the way out. But you can see I've got them in uh, the smaller, just opening up. Here's another one further, further along. When they first come out, they actually are flat because the center cone hasn't developed yet. So for a long time, I thought they were a different variety, but they're not. At some stage, they're flat. And then in full bloom, you'll see the big cone head top. I've got some of these beautiful flowers here with me. And here is the cone flower. I absolutely love this flower. And you can see it's got a lot of beautiful orange in it. So this one happens to have a lot of yellow greens as well. Very often, you'll see the color 
in the stem and in the leaves. And uh, these are some more ditch flowers. Look at, they're all from the same family. Absolutely, so fortunate. I got a whole pile of these with me today. So I'm actually drawing them from life. Plus I also have this great photo I snapped years ago. Now I'm using an HB pencil and I'm just coming, coming in. And one of the things I wanna encourage you to do is when you draw these, make them all different lengths. Sometimes you'll see the start of one and it'll turn, it'll come out the bottom into another behind. And we might be able to do one still real perky out here. There's little spaces in between here. Those are all really important. And don't draw this as a continuous shape. It, what it is is they're spiky. So I like to show the spikiness on all, in all cases. I want to show the spikiness. And very often when people draw their, their stems, they line them all up like a military funeral's going on. I mean, all the same space apart, same stiff. I purposely try to have these overlapping, a whole bunch of them overlapping. And when I do have a long stem, I always have something else interlocking, overlapping, always. So your eye is led from one to the next, here too. This was placed not out here, but behind it because it gives depth. So now when I put the stem in here, I'm not going to make it straight. I'm going to have it come down with a bit of a bend. It's a little bit wider at the top. And then there's actually, they're hairy. <laughs> I, I just love having the flower right here. That was the inspiration for this particular subject. They're all right now. And every now and then they have these wonderful green skinny leaves. Generally, they're right across from each other. No, they're not. They're alternating. So we're going to put this one over here, interlocking with that. And then this little guy here still needs to come down. So I'm going to have him swing down back here. And in this case, it's not a pick and plunk. They're not sitting in a vase. We're going to have them just end. And I think that's kind of fun. It's kind of tricky. Now see, I could have ended these, some of them on my breakout shape, but I didn't. I just brought them all down and they all end a little bit different spot. I purposely did that so that they wouldn't be lined up. So I'm doing the same thing here. As, as I get closer, some of these are going to come down more, some are going to stay up higher, some are going to have some leaves that interlock with them. And maybe one more leaf here. And I try to get all the leaves going at different angles. It's really hard to do that because we tend to want to do it all, all the same. But just get over that. Get over that. Got to change that. Maybe one more tall shaped one here coming from behind. Pull this down a little bit. So there we are, ready to get started. Oh, I can't wait. First thing I'm going to do is introduce my new color. This is ultramarine turquoise. And you can tell it's new. It doesn't even have its own space yet. I just squeezed it out here. And it really is pretty and transparent. I didn't think I'd ever be able to find kind of a teal color that is this beautiful. And this is where the fun starts too because you also are going to see these lovely textures that just magically appear. So I'm going to, first of all, try to get that spiky look by coming in here and painting into the spikes just a bit. And this is all negative painting, just coming around. And I might, I don't know if I want to, I'm not going to do this one in a perfect breakout. I'm just going to let this one kind of end. But you can see already how beautiful this is. You can see some of the lines just starting. 
And see, I don't, usually I have to worry about these edges drying on my regular paper. I don't have to on this one because if they dry, I can just activate them in a matter of seconds. So the most important thing now is I just want to get started on getting some of my color into the background, establishing this beautiful contrast between the white flowers and the background. You can see how nicely that gesso absorbs the color. It's really pretty. Things you can see here some of the palette knife strokes. And you have to like them. I always tell everybody it's like your kids. You have kids, you just have to like them. <laughs> you put all these textures on the paper, you have to like them. Because you're not going to change it. And every now and then if I can find a nice place to stop, like next to that edge, I think what I'll do is come over here. And I want to introduce some more color now. I'm going to go into some nice fresh yellow. Let's just throw that in there. Let's pull some of that through here. Maybe introduce some, some more texture. Now, anytime I want to, I can just come in with the water and just let it break into a nice edge. It's kind of cool. be working fast I'm getting some little bubbles <laughs> okay now I'm going to carry this same color over here paint around and I just love these spiky tops well, whatever you do, don't make them smooth. They're spiky. Keep them nice and spiky looking. A round brush is perfect for this. You can see how easily I can get in and out of these corners. If I want to, I can just start here with the tip. Tip, press down. Very nice. Now it's also nice to introduce some of the colors that are in your picture. So in this case, I'm going to now change this to a green just by introducing some pure yellow. Make sure you book in the same color here over here. It needs to go a little bit darker. And then I'm just going to introduce more pure yellow here. And I want to get into some of these lovely oranges. See, in my, in my painting, I have a lot of beautiful oranges. Quinburnt orange and Windsor orange. So I'm going to throw in some Windsor orange here. And it's so easy. You just start, introduce it from this side into that color. So look at, we went from that to green to orange. It's lovely. And I probably will take some of these lovely, this, some of this lovely orange and just spatter some of it into this background here. Give us, let's bring a little bit of that orange over here too. So just that quickly we can make some changes. So I'll pull this nice dark color up here, identify this little rascal. I think I'll go off the top here. Now I 
think it's time to make some adjustment here. Let's pull it out just a little. Now anytime you want to, you can also lift color with a tissue that makes a nice soft edge. Oh, I was just noticing. This looks like a coneflower here in the background. <laughs> I love it. And I'm I'm a big fan of this break, just putting in some of this dropping in the color like that. If you're not comfortable doing that, just go over and touch it. But I do like that look of the pure color coming in and just hitting the surface. Oh, it's so pretty. Now, if you really wanted to have some fun, you could just say, oh, I think I'll paint some flowers here in the background looking like cone flowers. Sometimes I do that, put in some of the, maybe some grasses. Maybe this person didn't weed their garden very much. I like, I love to put grasses in. <laughs> I think I'll get back now to my nice dark pattern here. So let's see, let's go back here. So now this is my ultramarine turquoise. Don't forget, every now and then there's just a little teeny bit of dark up here. I, I think of it as like the spaces between your teeth. <laughs> so now I'm going to make sure I bookend this color all the way around my subject. So if it's on this side, it's got to come over to this side, over here. Now we've got two stems close together. And if I notice it's not looking like the same color on each side, I don't have any choice but to get in there and manually adjust it. That's good. Oh, it's kind of pretty. I like the greens. So I think I'm just going to smooth this out, join the colors, and I'm going to have this one in a very light colored background. Come in with some yellow, maybe some of this orange again, and I'm just going to have a nice soft background color. And then the flower itself can stand out as dark against a light background. So let's give you the whole picture here. Now you'll notice in this one, I purposely did the shape within a shape, which I absolutely adore. So it's always hard though with a white flower. You can see the white flower breaking into a white space. You have to make the white flower darker. In fact, I may have to go a little darker with that. But this is fun where I have now this breakout onto the white. So I purposely made this darker against the light. So that's what's gonna happen over here. I'm just gonna go ahead and leave this lighter against a darker. This will be dark against a light background. And these up here will be light against a dark background. 
So now I'm going to think now about my path of dark. So I've got the dark coming here. I think what I'm going to do is pull the dark down here and down here. So I'm going to make it into kind of a triangle. And again, I think I'm just going to let this soften out into a nice light color. And I'm going to repeat some of this lovely orange over here. So we'll just leave this soft. I can always change it. That's what's so great about this gessoed surface. It's so easy to make adjustments. So we're going to leave this here, this area light and the flower will be dark against the light. And now as I move across here, I'm going to make sure that my dark path comes through here. So I'm just going to go ahead now and finish my dark path. Well, this is interesting. Look at look at what I've done. I've gotten all this paint on here. <laughs> Look at this, I can just pick it right up. Now you do have a little bit of staining, but <clears throat> generally it looks pretty good. I'll show you later how you can just lift away any, any little textures you like after it dries. Okay, you can see now I've started to develop my dark path over here. Now I want to bring my path down over here. So I'm just going to continue once again and I'm just going to pull this down here pretty much into this right into this corner here. You can see all those magical, wonderful, just, I love all those lines that just happened. This is so much fun. Now, if I want this to be darker, I didn't talk about this. I like to add colors that are really transparent and value nine dark. One of my favorite add, add on colors is this Antwerp blue. It's a, transparent it's a beautiful blue and if you want to mix it in with this it just gives you a little bit darker variety i find when you add indigo indigo will also make it darker but the indigo can dry a little deadly so if i want to make my darks just a little bit darker you'll usually see me adding a little bit of antwerp See, and I could even come in here and do some fun grassy shapes if I want. But I do like that additional darkness. So Antwerp, turquoise, dark, really dark. So in particular, I want to get that extra dark happening in my path of dark. So through here, and then up here. So we'll take a little extra color, Antwerp, turquoise, and maybe pull just a little bit of that dark, extra dark color up here. Then I'll just soften the edges out. It'll just settle in. That's what I love. It just settles in. 
See how pretty it accents. Oh, it accents all those things. Love it. <laughs> okay now we're at the point where we're against the dark flower so I'm going into my yellows mixing the yellow in with the blue to get some lovely greens oops I see I went over my flower I actually like this little light invading here. I think I might lift a little bit more out. And then I'm just going to take and lose these edges into a lovely lost edge here. And I'd like to see a little bit more of that orange repeated down here. That's Windsor orange. So I'm just going to put a little bit more of that here. Kind of connect it. Ooh, I get another chair. And I'm going to lose these edges down here, vignette style. I'm going to take that lovely green and pull that through here. I don't really have much of this orange over in here. I think I'm just going to add a... We're going to replace that chair. <laughs> I'm going to add just a little bit of orange. I love the look. I love that fresh orange. It's a transparent color, but it kind of lays on top. It's really pretty. Kind of gives the feeling like there's some little flowers growing in the background. Like it. So I'm gonna take a break and get a nice new chair. I'll be right back. Now I do have some areas here where I managed to Get color in there, and I have color invading where I don't want it. This is what's so lovely. I can just simply remove this. My flat brush is the best choice. So I just simply dampen this brush, wipe it dry. So now we have the thirsty brush, and see any of these shapes that I invaded that I didn't want there, with just a little flick, I can lift them out. It's so nice not having a squeaky chair. <laughs> Here too, the color went into that stem. We'll just lift it right out. Over here too. So I get to kind of clean things up. This is what's so lovely. A little flat half inch brush, wipe it dry. And now we have the benefit of the thirsty brush cleaning up edges. You can also use it to clean up any edges you don't like. Now my path of dart isn't real strong, but it does go behind these guys, comes out here, 
comes down here and now we're going to have some fun actually painting the flowers. Now you don't have to do the entire background first. It's, it's an option. I chose that option. On this one, you can see I chose the option to have that square, which is nice because it automatically places your, your flowers in the breakouts. They have to be darker than the background. Unless you just choose to make that shape another color, that's just another option. I like to offer options. Ooh, this is my favorite part. Now, I'm going to be showing you a lot of paintings after I finish this one. And some of those, I paint the flower first and the background later. So I chose to do the background first on this one, mostly because these are white flowers. And it's when you have white flowers and you get a dark background, that's fabulous. But if you have a red flower or a dark flower, you can't really do a dark background. You would equalize the colors, they'd be washed out. So we're going to start now. Remember this flower, I am going to push the colors so it becomes darker against the lighter background. So I'm going to start first of all with the cone flower head. And because of the way light touches it, I need my script brush. You can see that the head is not, if you just look at it, it looks like one color. But when you have the dark background and you have the light source like you do in nature, you're going to see some yellows, you're going to see some oranges, some deeper oranges, all the way to darks. And depending on the source of the light, it's going to go light to dark, light to dark. Almost all of those heads are going to have the same light pattern. So in this case, I'm going to start with the light over here coming in and then I'm going to remember that as I progress. So I'm starting with just some pure yellow then I'm just going to go around my palette I'll pull my palette in here so you can see it now I'm going to go into some of that orange the same orange that's in the background and I'm using my script brush it's like a rigger only shorter and just pulling in some of that. I'm even leaving little white holes. Okay. Now I'm going to go into Scarlet Lake. This is an incredibly beautiful color. Nice and rich. And I just lay it over those other colors and I'm working my way to the other side. Remember, don't, don't paint it like a smooth, like a gumdrop. Uh -uh. Keep it nice and prickly. Now I'm going into my quinacridone burnt orange. And this is going to be my darker color. So it's mostly going to be on this side with the little spikes, little dots. Oh, fun. Now I'm just going to take cobalt blue, straight cobalt blue. And when I come in with this color, I'm just going to put it on the shadow side. So it's on the shadow side coming down shadow side coming down pretty easy as I move around here always on the shadow side see and I don't have to worry about that hard line that is something I can lift easily later this is behind it's all in shadow this one here is going to be half shadow half white same here now these would be in a lot more shadow and the one behind is going to be in shadow now comes the fun part I want a little bit of this orangey color to come down the side of this almost like 
a reflection. So I'm actually tipping the paper and as I touch it here, see how that gravity allows it to just start to flow? You can help it along if you want. And it, I'm using my the same color here. I love that when they mix together. It's so pretty. So I'm just picking up this color and letting it come down. I'm trying to get it, uh, any one of these colors will work. Too dark there, we'll put it over here. Move it around a little bit. Okay, now I'm going to come in and soften some of these edges. It's that easy on this gesso. <laughs> I can just lift that color into a lost edge and save the white. Isn't that amazing? My brush is barely damp. I wipe my brush almost dry and just come in here and lift off that lovely edge. My brush is damp, but it's not wet. If it was wet, the color would be running. It's just barely damp. And then my background was still a little bit wet, so I'm just going to lift out some of this color that's bleeding. Oh, oh I like this. Now I almost need to go a little bit darker here. I think I'm going to pull off a little bit of this color. Get these just a little bit darker. I can make them a little bit cooler. Go back to my cobalt. These particular leaves, petals, have to be darker than the background. So I'm going to go, I'm going to come in with a little more cobalt here and go just a little bit darker. And I can adjust it later too. But I like it. So let's back out. See if we're getting a good contrast. You can see, yeah. It's not a real strong contrast, but I think I'm going to have to go just a little bit darker yet. So I think I'm going to take some Quin Burnt Orange. I'm going to add a little cobalt to it. So now I'm going to have like a dark brown. And I'm going to put in some more darks here on the shadow side. And of course, there's always more shadow as you're coming around the base here. Now that's helping a little bit. Popping it out a little more. And like I say, these are things that can be adjusted anytime. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do another flower for you. And then I'll just go ahead and finish the flowers because they're all going to be the same. So 
So again, I'm going to start thinking about my sun side. I'm going to come in here with my pure yellow. In this case, it happens to be Windsor yellow. Then I'm going to do my Windsor orange, beautiful transparent orange color. And I'm thinking spiky. Every time I do this, it's a spike. I don't even mind that little bit of green in there. Blue, actually. Now I'm going to go to my Scarlet Lake. And last, I'm going to do my quinacridone burnt orange. This little script brush, it's the handiest brush. It holds a lot of paint. You'll notice I can just keep painting and painting, and it seems like it never runs out of paint. And that's because it doesn't. If you use a little number one or two, you'd have to keep reloading. But this one holds an incredible amount of paint. Now the same thing. I'm going to come in with just pure cobalt blue on just the one side. Now I never wet anything. This is all done on dry surface. Just lift it out. Even if this dries, it's not serious. I can still come in and add that second color right over it. But see, I, to me, it doesn't look right, just blue and orange. I really like it so much better when you have the warm color in addition to it. We're not going to need as much on this one. Now these can actually be a little darker. They're on the shadow side. Well, not that much. Now we're going to take our orange and starting at the top, and I do like to give the paper a little bit of a tip, so gravity is working for me too. Remember, I don't worry about that hard edge because I can so easily lift that even when it's dry. I love that. Now you probably wonder, well, why don't you just mix the two colors and do it one time? It's not the same, believe me. When you put pure color on top of pure color, it's absolutely gorgeous. And you'll, I've got some other flowers I'm going to paint shortly, and you'll see that the difference is incredible. So I do like to do these separate. Now I'm going to just wash. I just washed my brush. Now I'm going to dry it. So it's just slightly damp. And see, I can just soften that edge that easily. 
to soften it. Because what I really want is I want the light to dark, light to dark. But I don't want that hard edge. It's actually easier to soften this edge if you just let it dry. I'm just so anxious to get it soft, I can't wait. <laughs> Now, I notice I've got some color. Oh, yeah. See, I can lift that color out. So cool. Any mistakes I can fix so easily. I think I need to put just a little darker color here to pop this out. We'll go just a little bit darker. See, and I don't want to leave it like an outline. That would be a bad thing. Bad. So we're just going to take a brush, damp brush, and just come in like this and lose that edge to a nice lost edge. these with the lost edges and these with the hard edges. Right now I'm kind of liking those hard edges. I might leave some of them. So I'm just going to go ahead and paint a few more of these. I'll be back shortly. some of these beautiful darks that I put over here. I think that adds a nice touch. So if we look now at Quinn Burnt Orange with a little straight cobalt added to it, we get this lovely, lovely, really, really, really dark color. And if we put just a little bit of that on the shadow side, that will give us a nice dark value. And that will also give us a nice dark down here at those some of those shadow areas. The very base, they need to be just a little bit darker. Now well, this is moving along here finally. It's been fun. I love the textures that are happening. Just love it. You can see again all this brush, I can't believe it, just can paint forever. Load it up once and just go for it. Now we need to do our stems. Ah. I purposely moved in close so I could show you stems and leaves. And what I like to do is I like to wet them first. So just very quickly wet it. 
and I like to use pure color. So if I come in now with the yellow, this is Windsor yellow, my primary yellow. And I put some of that on here too. Then Antwerp blue is my favorite color. Antwerp is perfect when you're doing greens. Remember I put a little Antwerp in here earlier. So let's come in here. Put in a little Antwerp. Over here. I can I can go a little darker here because I got a light background. That's good. But I don't want to go too dark. It's always darker underneath the flower. We have the shadow. I could actually use my turquoise color too if I'd like. Now the important thing is we need to repeat some of this orange color into the leaves. So again, pure color. Make sure your brush is clean. When you dig into that color, put the pure color down, especially on the stem. Pure Quinn Burnt Orange. I could also put a little bit of the pure orange if I like that. <laughs> so I'll do a few more leaves while we're here. Wet them first, put a little color in, add a little Antwerp. Now I'm against a dark background here, so I'm not going to go very dark. I'm going to keep these on the yellow-green side. But here, where this one's coming out into the light area, I'm going to make it darker. So you just keep reversing. Dark against light, light against dark. Light against dark, light against dark. But I still, in my leaves, I still come in and add just a little bit of that orange and it, it's a nice ploy for that very blue background putting a little orange in those leaves we're going to keep most of these stems in the dark very light in fact I can just kind of get a little bit of that blue to run in Watch this, I can just take, wet this with my yellow. This time I got the yellow on my brush and I'm just gonna let a little bit of that green roll in from the background. Practically painting themselves. Some lovely green. Same here, get some of that yellow, picking up some of the background green. Aha, but look what's happening here. Now I'm in a light area, so I need to go darker. Darker here. Darker here. So that's basically it. I'm going to quickly go ahead and finish this. Get a little bit of orange in almost every one of those stems.
Well, I think that's close enough to done. I'll give you a final shot later when I have time to clean up some edges. But all in all, I'm really pleased. It's kind of fun doing this lost edge. Remember when I said about spraying the edges before? That's because I enjoy this vignette style. So I just literally let these edges melt out into the white edge. And now if I want to do some real serious cleaning up, I can take a Mr. Clean Magic Eraser. I just cut them into little pieces like this. And using very, very clean water, squeezing it out really, really good. If I see this little spot down here, now I can just clean that right to back to white. So any edges that you feel you'd like to clean up, I can just come in with Mr. Clean. I frequently do this. I actually like those little dots. But anything you may have spilled or you don't like, Mr. Clean Magic Eraser is good. And I like to do that, especially for the edges. Then if you wanted to, if you really wanted to invade, like bring in a nice light. Of course, you could do it with just a tissue, but you could also do it with Mr. Clean. Just lift in a nice little passage of light back here. I like to get real brave at the end and just, ooh, see, I like that light happening. I might just come in here and lift out some more textures. And I see I like this flat surface for that. But you can also do this with a damp tissue. So when you have some really interesting textured areas in the background. If you want to accent them, just simply take a damp tissue or a damp Mr. Clean and you can lift a little more out. Like I like this light passage coming through here. I might lift it into some more lights and connect it to this passage here. See, that's kind of cool, that little light coming through there. Moving down here, moving up here. So it's fun. Take some risks. I hope you enjoy it. It's quite different from the one that I did as my preparation. I almost want to get in there and go a little bit darker. But a lot of times, the first time I paint a subject, well, of course, I've painted these before, but the first time I painted on this surface, I was just enjoying the texture so much, I didn't push it very hard. But it is pretty amazing that it does absorb this much color that you can get this dark. So now I want to share with you some other subjects use, using the same technique, but now different subjects. Now this is fun. This is a 15 inch square, but I purposely turned it and designed it to fit a diamond. And these of course are poppies. Again, I'm using a very dark background to pop out some of this, and I pulled it into a dark path. And I did come in and drew some pencil lines, so I've got a shape within a shape. And then I love to have breakouts. Oh. And it's always nice to repeat the color of your flower in the background. So you can see over here, I'm actually pulling in some of these lovely orangey colors right into the background color. And I can put this down as dark or as light as I want it. I can follow the edge or not be so perfect. If I do it on one side, I gotta do it on the other. But I really like pulling out that beautiful background color into this background area. And it's so easy to lose edges with it. And you can paint right over the colors. So if I want to get, maybe pull a little bit of that red, I can put it right over the green. I find this gesso an amazing, amazing surface to work with. Because you can layer, and I'm a layered style of painter. 
and the fact that I can layer that red over green and not get mud, beautiful. And these, of course, have these very dark centers. Let me paint that center for you. I'm going to start with alizarin crimson and phthalo green, two colors that are both staining, both value nine, but the good news is when they dry, they dry as a perfectly transparent black. Love it. So I can go all the way to black on this surface. This just sort of blows my mind. I don't know if you've ever painted on Yupo, a similar surface, but Yupo never, never really accepts the paint. It just dries on the surface. But look at this. You can get beautiful, beautiful darks all the way to black. And this will dry transparently. Now I did, I forgot all about using my new product. <laughs> this lovely um, watercolor medium. So I think what I'll do is I'll use some now so you can, can see it really does work. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take some of this watercolor medium and it comes with its own little squeezer outer here. So I'm just going to put a little on my palette. And then I'm just going to also throw a little water in it. And then over here, I want to go from a yellow on top into an orange into a deep red. So I'm going to start with my brightest yellow. This happens to be Windsor yellow. And this time I have the medium in it. And it, it's just a little bit smoother. It's actually kind of nice. Now I'm coming in with the Windsor orange. And the difference is when this dries, it'll have a slight shine to it. Now I'm going to go into the Scarlet Lake. And then we'll just kind of let these guys get acquainted here. and let it settle into those lovely textures. That's what I like about this process. The textures really tell the story. It's fun. Gets the light background there, so I gotta go a little darker. But here I've got the dark background, so I'll stay lighter. And then I'm also gonna go into a little alizarin crimson. Again, I'm going to take just a little bit of this on my brush, go into the alizarin, and put that at the very base. And I'll pull it up here. Always looking for that contrast. So there really isn't any difference in the painting. It's just that when it dries, you do have that slight shine, which I like. And you will notice that when you work with this gessoed surface, it does dry very flat. But when it goes under glass, all, all watercolor dries pretty flat. And when it goes under the glass, you'll see it just um, looks shiny and like fresh paint again. Now this color always has to come down into the stem. Really important. So in almost all these cases I've got to pull that color into the stem. Especially poppies. 
there's a lot of red in those stems. There, so I will have um, downloadable drawings of all these pieces that I'm going to show you with the color reference. And you'll just see a place where you can click and it'll be available to you. So if you want to paint any of these, just download the images. Here's another one with the red roses. And on this one, I was trying to just introduce maybe some little flowers in the background. But I think I still, I still have to go in and do some adjusting to almost all of these. I painted in preparation for this video. I, pre I painted most of these in the last couple days, so they all need a few touch-ups. But it's really going to be fun. I, I, my favorite thing is finishing a painting. So in most cases, I'm going to want to go a little bit darker, a little higher contrast. And I might even want to lift out a little bit more color in some of this background. I love the fact that I can do that so easily. I can just take, and I like this, I like this shape within a shape, but you'll notice I didn't do a hard edge. I just sort of made it up. And in some of the edges, I just have it a lost edge. I actually came in with Mr. Clean and I've got a lot of cleaning to do here. And I just came in with Mr. Clean and lifted out some of those edges. And I just love that when the light invades your picture. And you can't necessarily do this with other grounds. This ground is made for it. See, I just entered that beautiful light passage, which I can also bring up here if I want to. Now, one of the things that I haven't mentioned yet, but it's very important to know, when these are finished, you treat them just like any watercolor. They have to be under glass, in a mat, with a frame. However, this um, past couple years, I've been doing a lot of finishing where I actually treat it like an acrylic. And if I, if I wanted to um, glue this onto a surface or stretch it around a frame, well, for example, here. This is a framed canvas. And I prepared it, of course, doing the edges. And this, what I can do is put a finish on this by spraying four or five coats of Krylon clear acrylic coating. This is a artist product, so I do recommend Krylon. Don't just go to Menards and get any old varnish. Uh -uh. It's got to be the Krylon Clear Acrylic. I prefer the gloss, but it also comes in matte, and it also gives, gives you that built-in ultraviolet resistance. So I take this outside, make sure I know where the wind is coming from, and I give it a really good spray, sides and front, about four times. The other way I can finish this is with Dorland's Wax Medium. This is an incredible product, and you just simply put some gloves on, although I just go ahead and touch it, and you just smear this on here, and I um, recommend the Dorland's Wax. I really like this. Then you can take one of those cloths that are the microfiber and buff it. So you put the wax on, wait a few days, and then take that microfiber cloth and buff it into a nice little sheen. And this is ready to go on the wall. Don't have to do any glass. It saves you lots of money. Now this one here, this was really fun to do. These are, of course, those black-eyed Susans. And again, you can see my path of dark, my lost edges, the repetition of the same colors in the flower, in the background. And then here I even came in with some really strong darks, popping out my path of dark even more. You can see I've still got a little bit to go, but 
um, I'm kind of excited about this one. I think it's going to be fun when all is done. And if I want, if I had actually painted to the edge more, I would come around the edge and paint it. But I think what I'll do with this one is I'll put it in a simple little dark shadow frame. There'll be a little space and then a simple dark frame. This is the first one that I did in this style. And I did do a little live version of this that we put on Facebook. So if you look at the bottom of your lesson, you'll see that you can click on that. You can actually see me painting part of this. And this is also a bonus lesson. It was done in a classroom. So there are people talking and there may be some questions, but I think you'll enjoy seeing this um, created. It was really fun to do. And you, this one, you can really see the lines. It was one of my first ones. And I did the lines with the back of my brush which I do with more freedom. It's a little bit harder to do it with that knife. But see, it's so thick. Look at how dominant those lines are. But I like that. It's sort of, for me, that's part of the fun. This is a subject that I absolutely love. These are Chinese lanterns. And my mom had these all over her yard. She called them weeds. But to me, they were, I think, one of the most beautiful things made. So I frequently will go back and it's a real healing health. I think about my mom all the time I'm painting this. And one of the things missing in this, and see if you can figure it out, I have not repeated the color of the subject in the background yet. It's not too late. I've got a lot of time for development here. But I just feel that it is important to do that. And you can see I'm doing a lot of color changing, going from the dark into a mid-tone. But I don't think it would be that difficult to come in now with a little bit of orange. Another thing I'm thinking about with this one is to draw in a squared off corner here and maybe draw in another edge up here. So I'm going to be working with kind of a cruciform of a horizontal shape and then a vertical and horizontal down here. So you'll also have the drawing and reference photos for this and you'll see how I finished it. You might come up with a different idea but at this point I'm thinking about doing some shapes within the shapes. And then this one is my last one and this was really fun to do. I love sunflowers and I especially love sunflowers when they get to the end of their life. Actually, this isn't my last one. This is my second to the last one. <laughs> anyway, this is a finished picture. And you can see I did it over a toned canvas that had a lot of red. And so I just had to live with that red because it kept coming through the picture. But I kind of like it. It just warms it up. I think it would have been, wouldn't have been quite as interesting without that. Remember this from my First e-course, this was one of the lessons. And this actually has some gesso on it. And it was so much fun to paint. <laughs> what I did is I drew it again because I love the subject so much. This, this Jonas, my, Jonas is my production manager. And he went over and asked this gentleman on the main street, if we could have these dried up heads of sunflowers, I couldn't believe it. This, to me, this is a perfect subject. Absolutely love this. In fact, all my life, I've been taking pictures of these dried up heads. I remember spending a whole afternoon in a field one time. Look at these. They're absolutely beautiful. Maybe as I get older, I like these older things. I don't know what's going on. <laughs> But I'm enjoying them. So what I'm what I'm planning to do with this this one here is to treat it very subtly and to pull in some of these warm colors. And this this has gesso on it. And just using the earthy colors like raw sienna. Ooh. And see, it's really going to be fun to see this settle into those beautiful areas.
and I probably will key it up with just a little bit more color than the raw sienna, which is very, very earthy. Here you can see I've just added a little bit of warm to this. I could also add a little bit of bright color, such as Quinn Gold. So I think that's where I'm going to end. I'm just going to keep on painting here and enjoying it. I hope you enjoy painting on the gessoed surface. I know it's going to be one of my favorites forever. Thank you. As I finish this, we're getting a new chair. <laughs>